April 16th, 2024. On this committee is Mayor Clayton, Councillor Bosch, Councillor Thiessen, and myself, the Chair, Kevin O'Toole. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And I'll call for the vote. And that passes unanimously. Moving on, we have no delegations, but we have three reports. Uh, 4.1 service area update. And Chief McEachern, can you go through these for us? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, for our service area update today, I'll start with executive services and strategy. Uh, the community microgrant funding program was launched last week. The microgrant is available to organizations and individuals who are planning smaller events or art projects that will build community. Up to $1,500 is available per applicant. And those interested in funding uh, can go to our website, cityofgp.com slash funding for further details. The city clerk's office uh, updates that enumerator recruitment is progressing well in advance of the May 1st start of the 2024 municipal census. 53 enumerators are to be hired, trained, and onboarded before May 1st. In corporate communications, a uh, number of notable announcements over the last period, including the annual city scrub kickoff, a notice of the forthcoming police chief swearing in ceremony, reminder to use parks, paths, and trails safely, uh, and the Cedar Point name unveiled uh, for the previous uh, coordinated care campus. West Fraser awarded naming rights for Fieldhouse, and most importantly, um, communications around fire restrictions issued for Grand Prairie. The planning for the citizen satisfaction survey is now underway with the survey projected to take place in May. Approximately 500 residents will be contacted by phone with additional options for residents to complete an online survey. Supporting communication will help to ensure there's clarity between the satisfaction survey and the census, which is occurring at the same time. Uh, for Access GP, um, uh, there has been an increase in foot traffic here at City Hall for Access GP uh, as services at City and 99th transition to Cedar Point. Um, also, uh, we have Access GP has launched a front counter service at, at the City Service Center, enhancing support for our departments and improving citizen services. Intergovernmental affairs, just an interesting point. Uh, we wanted to highlight that uh, we held a meeting with the City of Vancouver's Intergovernmental Affairs Director, who is inquiring about our city's advocacy priority development process. So it's interesting that uh, City of Grand Prairie is being highlighted as a champion of advocacy. Um, and we've held joint advocacy meeting with the County Administration and Chamber of Commerce to discuss strategies for regional advocacy. Uh, human Resources and Health and Safety, April 28th, will mark the National Day of Mourning, honoring the lives lost, injured, or made ill due to workplace incidents. The city will mark this day on April 26th with a moment of silence at 11 uh, a.m. The reason for it being the 26th is uh, 28th is, is uh, on a Sunday. Um, the EDI committee uh, hosted a Kairos blanket exercise on April 15th. The activity uh, serves as an interactive and experiential educational tool delving into the historic and contemporary relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And at the museum, the EDI committee also hosted Dr. David Leonard for a lecture on the 125th anniversary of the Treaty 8 signing. Corporate uh, marketing, uh, sales and sponsorship have helped to raise over 100,000 for the National Aboriginal Hockey Championships. And another interesting highlight is the Earth Day promo, uh, that uh, promo reel um, that we released gained traction with almost 10,000 views and 27 shares. So the feedback indicated that new audiences were reached and generated a lot of interest in this event. And with that, I can take any questions. Any questions? I see none. How about we move on to public engagement 4.2? Can you lead us into that? 
Thank you, Chair. So um, with us today is uh, Director Philip Cooper and Corbin uh, Bowman, who is our engagement uh, coordinator. Uh, this is a policy that we brought to committee previously, um, but we are back with this with this policy with some updates, in particular around uh, the 2024 public engagement pro projects and uh, discussion on the framework that we use. And with that, I will um, pass it over to uh, Director Cooper. Thank you very much. So thanks for having us. Just as a recap for what we previously brought forward to Council, the package contains the uh, proposed Council policy outlining the method by which the City of Grand Prairie undertakes public engagement. Uh, a new addition that hasn't previously been with the City before is a Council procedure for uh, managing disruptive behavior. That is unfortunately a reality of some of the events that take place. So there is a document to facilitate knowledge and processes for that particular aspect of engagement, if and when it occurs. And then finally, the public engagement framework document. This particular document is really a public education piece. It's designed to inform uh, individuals who have questions about our engagement process. It's a document that can be shared with consultants that are maybe working with us through RFP processes. And it's something we can put on the website and actually refer to during engagement sessions if there are questions on how the, uh, the process is unfolding for that particular event. Uh, within the, the package, um, I would just highlight some of the main things that did change on the actual council policy. So we had updates to the policy statements, the reason for the policy, the definitions, the spectrum of, of engagement was added, and the responsibilities both for uh, council, city manager, and staff. And then new sections were added, again, within the policy, general principles, uh, public engagement process, reporting and evaluation, and legislative authority. So those are some of the, the additions uh, to the policy. The policy was last uh, reviewed, I believe, in 2013. There's a policy with the city to review policies every 10 odd years. And that was really what triggered this particular item uh, to come back before council for review. So those were the main pieces to look at. As an addition, I just wanted to quickly revisit and refresh our thoughts around the public engagement spectrum. So this is the IEP2 standard that most municipalities, certainly across North America, refer to when undertaking public engagement under uh, exercises, if you will is divided into uh, five components. And when you are looking at a, at a project or initiative that requires public engagement, it is quite important to spec it out correctly. So the first one that we often uh, involve ourselves with is inform-based engagement. And this is something that uh, is relatively straightforward and, and many things actually apply to informed based engagement. So you could have an event where you invite people into a conversation, educate them on what is taking place. At the same time, technically a news release actually works as informed in based engagement. You're putting out information, advising the public on something, and the goal is to share information through some form of, of methodology. So that's typically informed based engagement. Uh, consult is where you get a little more sophisticated. That's where you're getting into webinars, focus groups. You're inviting people into more of a, of a two-way conversation. You're listening more clearly, and you're, you're gathering feedback. Uh, where things start to get a little bit more different is in the realm of involved-based engagement. And this is where you're actually inviting people into perhaps a working group environment. You're actually delivering on an agenda of items to work through. You're coming up with uh, findings, deliverables, and you're, you're working together. You're involving people in a conversation, working towards some kind of goal. Uh, Collaboration-based engagement is not as common. Uh, quite often that is where you have an issue that's quite significant. And for example, maybe you appoint a committee to oversee the discussion, the topic. Uh, they are selected often by council. They have a very clear mandate and they re report back to council on what they have heard. Um, it's a very participatory based form of engagement. And then finally, uh, very infrequent, Although in British Columbia, these are required by legislation, you get into empowerment-based engagement. Typically, if you're borrowing money in BC, and I only say that because I used to work there, uh, you have to take these items to council and then to the community for referendum-based uh, voting uh, if you're borrowing a certain amount of money. Um, if you have very controversial topics, uh, you can also engage empowerment-based engagement. Not as common, but uh, it is an option that does exist. Um, as to how you spec any of those five forms of engagement, 
Um, it's worth noting that you can do so by considering both the level of influence and the level of impact. So depending on where those different uh, topics and, and discussion points lie, typically informs the process of how to spec it out. So in the case of the city of Grand Prairie, as many communities across Canada, most of our engagement falls into inform through involve, and then on occasion you're getting into collaboration and empowerment uh, level of influence is also based on a technical analysis of what's being proposed. So the more technical the topic matter, the less likely the public can fully participate. You're getting more into legislation, policy, things of that nature. Um, whereas level of impact, uh, that is something that everyone can uh, be a part of. So often you'll see higher levels of, of impact influencing uh, where you spec it out and lower level of lower levels of influence depending on the technical aspect of, of the project itself. So those are the main elements of how we undertake public engagement in terms of the spectrum. I'll turn it over to Corbin, who will talk about two things on the forthcoming RFP we're issuing, and secondly, the exercise we went through in November, December to spec out all of this year's engagement projects. Thank you. Uh, so as Philip mentioned, this year, corporate communication will be going to tender for the city's engagement platform. So our current platform right now, uh, Engagement HQ, formerly known as Bang the Table, um, has been in place since 2018. So the purpose of going to tender is to explore other platforms that may bring improvements or innovative ways to engage the public. Um, in addition to the RFP, we are requesting proponents to provide tools and tactics um, for exploring the process of creating a control group um, to establish consistent feedback on engagement projects and to increase memberships on the engagement platform. Uh, so in December 2023, uh, we hosted an internal <coughs> engagement uh, public open house for depart departments that regularly conduct engagement projects. So the purpose of the open house was for departments to identify any projects that they have upcoming and then work through some exercises uh, to determine where their projects land on the engagement spectrum. Um, so after that open house, we determined and developed this list of our upcoming 2024 public engagement projects. And as you can see, the projects are color coded by where they land on a spectrum um, from those exercises that we did with departments. All right, I think that concludes our uh, presentation portion. So council has questions and more than happy to take them. I got uh, Councillor Bosch here that's got a question for you. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the first slide? I think it was impact was your first one, was it? Uh, inform. Inform? Inform-based engagement, yes. Inform. Now, um, the example techniques, you had talked about media releases, but where in here, and you probably have it, but just not listed, do you involve our, our local media outlets? So um, the radio side of it, the social media side of, of our radio stations that reach a tremendous amount of people. How do you Im like put that in with our own? So any, any engagement undertaking uh, includes a public information campaign around the actual event. So we work with our colleagues in marketing. We put together our marketing communications plan that promotes uh, the event, the reason for the engagement, even the type of engagement we'll be doing. And there will be earned media outlet through a news release that triggers their attention. Uh, they may do an interview with us or with the mayor on that topic. And we would explain uh, why we're doing it, when it's being done, what the value is of that engagement. And if there've been any issues that have come up surrounding it, try and mitigate you know, some of the things we've heard already and, and explain uh, the rationale for discussing this particular topic. Uh, as a tactical aspect of really any of these particular forms of engagement, you can include uh, the media as a vehicle to create a platform upon which uh, you have another way of, of putting out information. So I don't believe we have it here in Grand Prairie, but uh, until quite recently you had, for example, uh, talk show radio, you could engage with them and bring on speakers that are perhaps uh, part of a particular point of view that you're engaging on and have conversations with them, help get the information out. Uh, traditionally, when you had papers of record, you could also get editorials and things of that nature with which they're contributing towards. So the, the media landscape has obviously changed over the last several years. Some of those tools are no longer available to us. 
but through video, social media, they're still that these events are taking place and ensuring that uh, attendance and participation is as high as possible. Does the city ever uh, pay for ads in particular um, for an event? I certainly have lots of experience doing that in the past, uh, whether it would be here in Grand Prairie or elsewhere, that is a method. If you're dealing with a topic to which you feel there is an importance in notable turnout, then you really should be using every method as possible to uh, get attention, and that would include paid media. Uh, social media does have paid components as well. You have push content on Facebook, and, and that can dramatically increase attention on a topic. So the, the use of money to build awareness and improve participation is certainly something that is considered. Perfect. I think I knew that, but I think everybody needs to hear that. Thank you. Okay, I got the mayor and then Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Carol Tool. A couple uh, observations in the report that you included in today's presentation in regards to public engagement projects. Um, there, um, there's a lot of events, let's call them, engagement events that are identified as um, under the practice of consulting. And I think that's exactly what the public is looking for. However, I'm wondering if there's ways to improve that because I feel like the public is taking them as inform sessions, not consult sessions. And so whether, so they think that we're providing the input or information rather, and they don't think that they're being offered the opportunity to provide their opinion. So I'm wondering um, through um, the practices that maybe we could, the um, facilitators of the event could be more encouraging to the public that the point of this is to get your opinion. This is not just an information session. We actually want your input. So whether that means that every person at the station that has information for the resident to digest has a clipboard there saying, do you want me to help you fill this out? Whatever that is, I think we need to encourage more input because I feel like the public is taking these as information sessions, not consultation sessions. And with that, I'm wondering if there's a strategy in this, in today's presentation, um, that might be missing, or if you're coming back to us with ways to improve, to have better outcomes on our engagement. I think our engagement, you know, what you've presented today is excellent. I still believe that there's a lot of the community that doesn't feel that we do a great deal of engagement, which factually is incorrect, because you can see that we are. And um, I hear on a regular basis that, well, I didn't hear it on the radio. Well, I didn't hear it here. I didn't get a mail, mailer about it and I completely understand and, and how a full multimedia marketing campaign works and I just wonder if maybe we're A, I don't know if we're missing some of the elements or if B, we have a strategy going forward to have a better point of engagement being two ways, not just us informing the public. So through the chair, I think one thing I would do differently is, um, and it's not happening presently with the, with the regularity that I'm accustomed to, is it for notable engagement projects, and even some of the smaller ones, actually kick them off by coming to council and doing a bit of an outline around here's what's being proposed and going into some of those details concerning how it will be uh, promoted, a clarity on the type of engagement, and then even within maybe the materials that we're using to advertise it, be quite specific on saying this is consult-based engagement and here's what the opportunities are for you as a resident and these are the things that will be available for you to participate in a consult-based format or involve, where you're going to be having workshops, tables, collaboration at the tables. So to your point around uh, there being a concern that it's only involved-based engagement, and the engagement types are obviously dependent on the types of issues we're dealing with as well. If, if the city of Grand Prairie constantly has only informed-based engagement initiatives, then the experience with Involve and Collaborate, for example, would be quite low across the community. Um, or if you have a lot of issues that are reasonably easy to uh, digest as a resident and you have that lack of of controversy, then again, some of those higher forms of engagement won't take place. But I think we can do a better job of perhaps explaining the type uh, what's involved and, and why you should get involved. And when you do attend, here's what you'll get exposed to. And if I could share a tool, I think as you've identified in the public engagement projects for 2024, I think to my interpretation, none of them are incorrectly assigned to the type of engagement. It's exactly to your point that the public need to be 
encouraged that in a, a consult type um, platform, they're expected to provide you know, input on that. It's not a come out and learn. We're not calling it a come out and learn. This is a consultation process. With that, we're looking for your feedback. And maybe it's as simple as that, reminding people that we're looking for your feedback. We're not just looking to provide information. And so it's another topic that um, council recently discussed in regards to accessibility to council. And I think that another message in that is council will be in attendance. And because on certain types of things, information sessions, probably not likely. But in consultation and involved type sessions, council traditionally has been there. So just reminding people of, A, we want your feedback, and B, this is an opportunity to engage with council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got one more, if you're ready. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman O'Toole. Uh, similar to Mayor Clayton's, um, one thing that I, I thought about, especially when going over the Inform, Consult, Involve, Collaborate, and Empower scale, is when I went to that back page on the report, uh, my question for you is, 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 is this color-coded report going to the public? Is it going to be front-facing to the public, either on our website or, or in, this, in this public engagement? Uh, th through the chair. So the framework document is a public facing piece. It includes the engagement spectrum. Okay. And really, as a regular discussion point at most engagement sessions, we often do enter into a discussion on the IEP2 spectrum and how it works and why we've chosen uh, collaborate over and involved. So uh, constant awareness around how engagement works, the different models that e exist, uh, and reminding people that on certain topics, uh, particularly if it's controversial, there's a sense of well, I'm, I'm here to cast a vote, and, and that's obviously not the case. That's that's where the council's role falls. But um, yeah, they are public-facing documents and easily accessible on uh, both the engagement HQ as well as the uh, city website. So, so this one right here, like it's kind of the this one. It's, oh the yeah, it's kind of it's an I think it's for council, document. but well, this to the. Uh, we certainly could. I, I hadn't considered that. You're referring to the uh, the map ahead of 2024 engagement yeah. projects. Yes, I think that that is something that could be put out there. So there's awareness of forthcoming dates. Um, it would also address uh, the ongoing challenge of people saying, well, this is the first I've heard of it. If we start to promote the fact, well, actually, a lot of our engagement events are spec'd out over the course of the year. If you follow that page, you'll get a better sense of when certain things are coming up. So it does provide us that ability to say we're doing our best to not only engage you as a community, but also provide you notice on when these forthcoming events are taking place. Yeah, and I think that could be very valuable, which is why I asked the question. Another thing, just a comment is, um, I know that we didn't have anything under collaborate or empower, obviously in the hopper for 2024. I can give you a couple examples of that, but uh, just something that happens year round. I know in that spectrum, it said um, advisory co committees could be there, but we have our food security committee, which just gave a report here today. We also have the Community Advisory Board on Housing and Homelessness and YAC. Those are just three that are year-round where we collaborate with different segments of our population. And that could be something nice to show that, hey, you know what, we don't just inform, consult, and, uh, and uh, involve you. We also collaborate with you. And whenever we get the opportunity to empower you, we do. So I think that could be very valuable. Uh, and if I may, Mr. Chair, I just have one suggestion for a procedure. Um, I really appreciated the de-escalation training uh, segment of that. I, I really, I think it'll be a valuable tool for staff and for council today and in the future. Um, one thing though, uh, I guess a question, and then I have a suggestion. But my question is, is it's, it's, it's titled de-escalation training for administration and council in section two, I believe. Um, are we offering training to staff on this and to council? Well, is that part of the training procedure? Or would it be better if we're not offering the training and those are just the guidelines to how to de-escalate inside of a contentious situation, uh, that we relabel it rather than say training uh, to process, de-escalation process or de-escalation guidelines? Because it's a real nice list of things that you do from start to finish and it seemed more of a process or a guideline of the steps to follow rather than an actual training program. 
Thank you. So the chair, I can answer that one. Um, we do offer uh, a number of health and safety uh, related trainings around de-escalation, around um, conversations, et cetera, as well. So it is a, a full training program that we have available. We are currently looking at additional training that can be offered through uh, Biz Trainer uh, for council members as well. So I, I would say we have the training, but we also have ongoing discussions about how we can improve um, communication and uh, you know the opportunities to to de-escalate any uh, controversial conversations that occur. Yeah, no, and I really appreciate that. I guess my question just simply is: is when we we put it out in the procedure, when it rather than call it training, could we call it like process or guidelines? I know I'm maybe getting on semantics here, but it doesn't really strike me as a training list. It seemed more like a guidelines to follow and the best steps to take. Yeah, through the chair, it's something we can we'll, we can review and take into consideration. Thank you. Got uh, one more question from yeah. Councillor Bosch. Thank you. Um, and maybe you said this already and I wasn't paying attention, but when you're talking about consulting, involving, and collaborating, to me, they're, they're very much the same in many ways, just on a spectrum. Um, so to get feedback, you're still involving and collaborating. So how do you differentiate these three that they're a solidly different versus a spectrum of the same? Uh, through the chair, that, that's a great question. Uh, often uh, consult, involve, and collaborate are, are if, you, if Corbin goes back to that other uh, slide we had up earlier, that, oh, I'm not sure who's in charge of the, uh, it's this one here. It's the- Yes, that's the one I'm looking yeah, at. Influence versus uh, interest. Uh, so as the influence goes higher and as the uh, interest, sorry, as the influence goes higher and as the influence, interest rather goes higher, that shifts you up the spectrum. So you move out a consult into involve into collaborate. Uh, so you're dealing with uh, higher levels of knowledge, higher levels of uh, issues management, and therefore a greater need to have a much more uh, focused and organized discussion uh, with, with the public. Um, to give you some examples of projects I've worked on which are um, uh, sort of at the collaborate level, for example, uh, I've done two major parks engagement projects over the years where there are very controversial issues around what was going to happen in the park. So the council of those communities put together parks committees specific to that issue and worked through a discussion around how best to resolve that problem. Um, in terms of involve, uh, I know they're not as common here in Grand Prairie, but they're very common certainly in other parts of uh, Alberta and certainly British Columbia. Uh, bike lanes are always typically scoped out at involve-based engagement. Uh, you're, you're, you're consulting and you're involving, but you're, you're, sorry, you're informing and you're consulting, but you're involving them because you have to determine where that bike lane goes, what it intersections it's going to cross over, or what property boundaries it's gonna run across. So there's a need to actually sit down in a closer conversation and have those detailed discussions work out. Uh, and then consulting-based engagement, um, that's where it's just, it's more than informing. You need to get some feedback on something. You need to demonstrate that you heard. You need to demonstrate that uh, you're listening effectively and you're actually considering that feedback in the final documents that go to council for council to decide upon. So again, looking at levels of interest versus levels of influence and how you, how you plot those out is gonna land you on the engagement types. Okay, I think, I think this, as models change in time, we have to educate ourselves too, as a, a council in a city, um, admin in regards to how these things progress too, because I think that's a changing landscape all the time. So I too will have to, you know, go through the the avenues of, of differences here and, and learn what they mean. Thank you. Uh, we've got one other question from Councillor Blackmore. Um, thanks, Councillor O'Toole. Although I'm not on this committee, I'm going to ask this question anyway. Um, I understand that not all columns apply to all people equally, depending on the type of engagement you're undergoing. But could you explain to me under Empower where it says, we will implement what you decide? Because I'm not sure that that's a promise that we can make in a 
document. Um, I think that that may change scenario to scenario. And so could you tell me what that means to you? Certainly, uh, through the chair. So I've only seen empowerment done on, on uh, two occasions, and they both involved uh, event centers, actually. And so the, uh, the topic of whether the community should proceed forward with an event center triggered a referendum because there was a borrowing requirement. And the engagement was done uh, for the purpose of informing primarily what the value of an engagement or an event center could be. And then uh, it was up to residents to determine how best to cast their vote because the, the city of both uh, Penticton and the city of Nanaimo had to borrow money. And provincially in BC, that triggers a referendum. So the, the requ requirement that we will implement what you decide is legit. The public is speaking on that particular topic. Um, there are other examples where you would do empowerment. It gains way up that spectrum, and you're literally uh, giving control of the, of the issue over to the community to decide upon through a vote of some form. Um, there could well be a whole load of educational components that take place in advance of that through workshops, education sessions, you name it. But ultimately, uh, council is removing themselves from that decision and empowering the community to decide on it. If, if I were a citizen reading this document, I would not read it in great detail. I'd probably skim it and I'm gonna see that line and then I'm gonna say to Mayor Clayton later, you said you were going to implement what I said and you did not. So is there some other way we can wordsmith that so that it's not such a flat statement? I, through the chair, I think to Mayor Clayton's earlier point, one of the things we can be better at, if, if that is an issue, is being very clear on the type of engagement we're dealing with. So there's no confusion that uh, by attending an event that we're holding, we're, we're doing empowerment-based engagement. Um, that, I think that would be the easiest way to address it, is this clarity on the form of engagement. The IP2 spectrum is well adopted by uh, communities across Canada. So I, if, if it's an issue, it's being encountered by all all users of this particular methodology, but I think uh, ongoing clarity on the different types of engagement and what you're, you're entitled to be a part of would be uh, the best way forward for your question. I have to say that I still have concerns. I think one of the reasons that we see uh, C to C, a great distrust of politicians and government in general is because people have said that you've told us you're going to do this and then you didn't. And I think anytime we make a statement that says we will implement what you tell us, we're, um, we're creating uh, a level of, uh, we're opening ourselves to a level of distrust and I'm not really comfortable with that statement. And, and if I could, take it out of the document, I'd be 100% supportive. But at this point in time, I don't think I can support this document when it comes to council. I got... Uh, the CAO, what's in? Okay, sorry. I uh, appreciate your concern and I appreciate Director Cooper's response and the need to, uh, or that we can have, um, do more in education. Uh, Really, just thinking through, this is a the gold standard. Like we we've selected a uh, um, a third party's um, a matrix to go forward, uh, and we've been we've been implementing that now. I think for about six years. Um, so to start tweaking the gold standard, um, it sort of uh, negates using the the standard. And so I'm just unsure how we would. Uh, so I appreciate, uh, and as you saw, we haven't had any empower suggested on uh, on our uh, upcoming events. Uh, I'm unsure how we start to amend someone else's gold standard and um, and and continue with this uh, the value in using it at all. I'm just I'm just unsure of what this direction would mean. Mayor Clayton, thanks, Chair O'Toole. Um, in my opinion, the only exercise that we will do in public engagement under Empower is a public election, and so you ready? if there's an agreement on you know I. As indicated, there's no empowerment type sessions being put forward for consultation, but there's nothing that comes to mind, in my opinion, that would qualify as an empower type engagement other than a public election, which 
I mean, because even if you're doing a referendum, that can be used for political purposes to c gather information. It may not be implemented to Councillor Blackmore's point. So other than the public election, it's the only sort of item that I think that is empowering per se. Great. Uh, go ahead. I would just add uh, one other possible is uh, um, a plebiscite. So it's uh, that uh, that is a different degree from from referendum. So it could be a tool if um, if uh, council is looking for us to remove this from our spectrum, we can do that. But there, those would be the election and plebiscite would be the two where it, it could be possible uh, down the road. Great. I got two people in the queue. I got the councillor Thiessen and councillor O'Connor. Yeah, uh, Sue Rose took some of my thunder. He, luckily, he didn't take all of it. I wrote down a plebiscite and neighborhood associations because it's through the neighborhood associations that we really work to guide and empower our neighborhood associations to implement things within their own neighborhood that we get behind. So if they, if, yeah, sure, if they fit, but part of, part of what we do through our neighborhood associations is we navigate them through the processes and empower them to be able to do the things that will improve their neighborhood. So that is, that is one area, and it's a small area, of how we empower the public to come forward and make changes that they request to council and then we can move forward with that. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the language. Uh, I did have some of the similar concerns as Councillor Blackmore had the first time I read it, like many members of the public, just sort of a skim. But as I got deeper into it onto the weekend, um, I think it's pretty, pretty clear uh, on that we're using these are, as it's stated, the promise to the public and example techniques. So there, there's a box there. Maybe it could be formatted a bit better. I don't know, because they're on two separate pages. Uh, the involve, collaborate, empower, at least on my iPad. But uh, I, I find that when I read it through it succinctly, that what I discovered was, is that it read really well. And we're just looking at a spectrum here. We're not looking at, this is what we're going to do for you at the end of the day. So good work, everyone. And I think this is our, going to be our final yep. question here. So. Okay. I, I also have the same concern that uh, Councillor Blackmore brought up, is that you're saying that you will actually do something. You're making a promise to do something. And I think that's very dangerous language. And I think, just as a suggestion, that I said, we will take your information under uh, consideration. And then it's ultimately up to us. Unless you go into a plebiscite or you're going to a referendum, uh, the decision falls on the council. So I really have a problem with the verbiage there. All right. I think we're done with questions. Any following statements? I will let you go. I nothing from myself, no. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being here today and giving this information. I think... Uh, it caused more debate than some of the other topics today. So there you go. You're controversial. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. I would um, look forward to this discussion with all of council. And with that, I make a motion that committee recommend council approve policy 128, um, the engagement policy, and repeal policy 118, the citizen engagement policy. Speaking to that motion, I look forward to a full conversation with council. I think that there's a significant amount of work put in here, and I appreciate the thorough process. I look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Motion is good. Call for the vote. Once again, thank you for being here and providing information today. Mayor Clayton, in favor? Carried unanimously and we'll move on to fire awareness it's a verbal update and chief mccracken thank you chair um so today we have uh, director cooper at the table uh staying at the table and with him is um Deputy Chief uh, Mike Anderson, uh, Deputy Chief of Operations with the Fire Department, and they are just going to provide um, an update today on uh, communications around fire awareness uh, for Council's, Council's awareness. Excellent. Please go ahead. Uh, 
All right, thank you very much. So we'll, we'll try and keep this as brief as possible, recognizing the time. The goal here today is to, to do two things, outline what the city's official plan for communicating information on the threat of wildfire is through the spring and summer of 2024. And then because I'm not in, by any means a fire expert, uh, we have uh, Deputy Chief Anderson here to provide some insights from a fire point of view. So with that noted, um, we are anticipating uh, a hotter and certainly drier uh, spring and summer. So in light of what took place, not only in uh, Grand Prairie last year, but across Western Canada, fires are, are a very serious matter and are getting lots and lots of attention. So we need to uh, cater to that interest from our residents and put out a campaign that provides them with the confidence and reassurance that not only is our fire department uh, ready to respond, but we're also putting forward information that the community needs to keep them educated. So in that capacity, the city via, via my team will be working alongside the fire department as well as our colleagues over at the county to make sure that uh, our residents are as informed and as prepared as possible as we head into uh, the spring and summer. So we've got three basic goals uh, that we'll be undertaking uh, as part of a communication plan. The first is to generate as much awareness and preparedness as possible. Uh, second is classic fire education. And third, uh, every year uh, we always have an opportunity to promote and be a part of Emergency Preparedness Week, which is May 5th to 11th. So on the first point, uh, aware and prepare. Um, there are a number of things that uh, the average property owner or renter can do to make sure that uh, they're ready for a, a forthcoming uh, fire season. Uh, the classic example is to survey their property to determine if there's anything around the house that's going to be a problem in the event of a fire. So putting out educational information around that, how you can prepare your home and surroundings in the event of a fire. Uh, also wanting to remind people in an uh, emergency situation, it's best to be prepared. So if you haven't built your 72-hour kit, please do so. That's a great way to get your family as an individual as well, ready to uh, embrace the realities of, of living in an area where there are risks of wildfire. Um, and then classic messages concerning things like, you know, be responsible if you're a smoker, uh, what to do if you're having uh, campfires, things of that nature, just general reminders, whether you're here in Grand Prairie or taking a vacation, how you can be a steward of best practice policies and procedures around fire usage, etc. Um, also reminding people of the realities of, of emergency evacuations, education surrounding that. And then even if you don't have a fire locally, you can end up dealing with other people's fires. So we want to re make recommendations why you can still buy them, you know, get yourself an air purifier, mass stocked up. Uh, there's nothing worse than being in a house where there are no fires, but having to breathe in smoke from other places. I remember 15, 20 years ago when I worked in Fort McMurray, we spent about a month breathing in smoke from fires in China because they just blew over. So get prepared if that's a problem for you. And then finally, uh, for those of us with ATVs, things of that nature, you know, best practices and procedures around how to operate those in a safe way. So a whole litany of classic messages to get people prepared and reminded as to how they can uh, best be a part of a solution and not prevent a problem at the same time. Um, another thing that comes up during this time of the year is making sure people are aware of how they can stay informed. So in addition to following content on the city Facebook page, reading our news releases, reading the articles our media publish about city undertakings, there are a number of alert opportunities as well that you can get on your phone or from other websites. So one of the classic examples is the Alberta Emergency Management Agency. They provide information that you can subscribe to and get sent to you. They're of course, is Access GP, our own in-house resource, and they also put out text messages. Uh, Alberta Fire Bands is another one. If you're going to be out in the community, out in different parts of Alberta, you should know if there are fire bands in place. And on that note, we are presently in a fire ban here in Grand Prairie. And one thing we'll be adding to our website uh, this season is an alert at the top reminding people there is a fire ban in place. So please act and behave accordingly. Don't be irresponsible. Uh, Alberta Wildfire Status App is an entire app you can download and get information around wildfires in general. And then finally, it's kind of an interesting one, you may have used it last summer, is the smoke forecast, firesmoke.ca. And that's a map you can look at. It tells you exactly what the smoke conditions are in your specific area or where you're planning on traveling to. And then you can get those masks ready if needed. In regard to fire education, 
Uh, one of the biggest challenges in an urban area like this isn't necessarily uh, the surroundings we have presently, for example, downtown. It's that interface area between the urban landscape and the wildfire uh, regions. And that's where you get that fire creep. That's where you have that danger. If you watch a lot of the events taking place, say last summer in West Kelowna, all of the homes that burned down were in that classic wildland urban interface area and that's where the damage occurs. So in the case of Grand Prairie, uh, those are typically gonna be found uh, in the south or anyone who has a property back in a forested park area. That's creating the same dynamic of trees and residential or business properties. And you need to be very mindful of your fire smart behaviors and practices to be prepared in the event that there is a fire in that location and it spreads towards your property. Um, another area of classic fire education is working with uh, the youth of our community and providing information to them that they can learn about uh, best practices for fire smart behavior, what, what they or their parents can do around their home. So we will have resources that speak to them. And then finally, working in close conjunction with, with the county, they are our partners throughout this entire season. We'll be uh, doing a joint campaign on, on emergency preparedness week, which will profile all the different kinds of classic emergencies that may occur here in Grand Prairie and making sure that um, all of that public education information is put out there in a way that, that's usable and meaningful. So there are a number of events planned uh, to get that information out. And we'll also be working with a number of pre-existing uh, information campaigns that the province of Alberta has put together to help leverage continuity uh, with them. We don't all want to be doing uh, our own version of something. We want to have continuity across our different platforms. So that is another thing we're committing to doing, whether it's the, for example, the uh, fire department Facebook page, the city Facebook page, or the county Facebook page, having very similar content and messaging on all those different platforms. So you're not getting a mixed sense of, well, one said this or the other said that, and then taking a look at what the province is also putting out and creating that, that common message, that common sense of here's where we're at so that people are very clear on how best to prepare uh, and how best to educate themselves. So that's the, the campaign in a nutshell, and I'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Anderson to provide some more specific information. Yes, thank you very much. Um, they're just going to provide a quick update on some of the highlights that we've done in terms of prep since last year. Uh, the biggest one is that we did a wildland urban interface training that was uh, provided uh, through the IAFF. And the key there is that uh, that training is all standardized through uh, throughout anyone that takes it. So it's uh, really important that when we work with our partners that we have that same common language and training. Um, we've also updated some of our uh, equipment or smaller items, fire hoses, et cetera. All that stuff's been ordered. And also too, we've moved in from our winter operations into our summer operations. We do that every year. We're also exploring two grants uh, that are out there that are, aren't free or related, but they're also large equipment grants. And so we're currently exploring those. Um, one of the things too that I wanted to share today was that in terms of the fire ban language restriction. Um, anytime we, we do put out notice on the albertafireband.ca, we partner with the county. Uh, some of the feedback we had last year was that um, the language didn't necessarily align the same. So uh, anytime if, the, if anybody upstates their fireband status, we send notice to the county and we kind of align the language because sometimes our uh, we do have borders, but when people go to look at stuff, it uh, we should have it kind of relatively the same and fit our area. So um, you'll notice that when we have a fire ban restriction, we'll also have a similar restriction and that language will be kind of the same. Um, also too, we're gonna be pretty preemptive and uh, if we, we feel the need to have that ban based on uh, a whole host of factors, we're, we're gonna be doing them uh, a lot more frequently too, just as that preventive me measure. And also too, we're taking a look at um, engaging with all our uh, city partners that deal with the, the street engaged population. Uh, we got a meeting in a couple of weeks. Last year, we had uh, an operation throughout the Musco CB Park where everybody got together and we uh, actually had TSARS drone and 
and we drew on the whole area and then we went out and found the different encampments and stuff like that and and asked um, those citizens that uh, if they can move into other uh, shelter spaces so we're preemptively in the next couple of weeks going to sit down and just kind of re-engage and so everyone knows who they are at the table so we're also going to be doing that and uh, May 14th I'm also coming back just to provide a free a grant uh, update report for that as well but I can answer any questions if anybody has anything in terms of that right now so yeah. call the question anybody have questions for the people at the front I see none so you Ooh. you were very informative <laughs> and we were able to understand all the language so here we go thank you thank you I'll carry on uh, we have no uh, any correspondence we have no other business no bylaw policy review we have an outstanding items list with one item on it is there any changes thank you chair no changes recommended for the outstanding items list okay. I'd look for someone to do the business on that and then we'll move into being over i'll do that for you i move committee receive the april 16th outstanding items list as presented for information thank you call the vote and that's carried unanimously I now move that this meeting is adjourned and we will move on to Operational Services Committee and that'll be a couple of minutes as well so we can get things changed.